This video is aimed at achievements done by AMD across the past decades and was made to enlighten people of what AMD brought to the hardware and software markets over the years. If you enjoy this video, leave your like so I can later do similar ones for Nvidia and Intel. Hope you enjoy it. In the past decades, AMD has been one of the top dogs in the CPU and GPU market, and most people interested in the area know the company and their products pretty well. But how did AMD get to where they are now? Where did they start? Before that, let's have a short word from our sponsor. Today's video sponsor is GVG Mall, where using my SKG discount code leads to a 25% off across several products making a Windows 10 serial key only $16. After the payment, you'll receive the key in your account and all you need to do is to introduce it in your Windows settings and BAM! You have an activated system. AMD was formally incorporated by Jerry Sanders along with seven of his colleagues from Fairchild Semiconductor on May 1, 1969. Sanders was an electrical engineer working as a marketing director and, like many others working there, grew tired of the lack of opportunity and flexibility. So, he did what some do, created his own company, following the steps of Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore, who quit Fairchild Semiconductors to found Intel in July 1968. In the same year, AMD moved from its temporary location in Santa Clara to Sunnyvale, California, in order to immediately secure a customer base, being initially a second source supplier of microchips designed by Fairchild and National Semiconductor, having assured a guaranteed quality control to United States military standard that was a big advantage considering the unreliability of most chips back in the days. The first proprietary product from AMD was released in 1970, the AM2501 logic counter, which was highly successful. In 1971, AMD entered the RAM chip market beginning with the AM3101, a 64-bit bipolar RAM. That, and other things like the greatly increased sales volume of their linear integrated circuits, made the company reach a total annual sales value of $4.6 million, and considering AMD was only two years old back then, the results were great. AMD went public in September 1972 as a second source for Intel MOS slash LSI circuits, with products such as the AM1506 and the AM1507, which were dual 100-bit dynamic shift registers. Intel have also released their first microprocessor in 1971, the 4-bit 4004. And knowing that, AMD entered the market as well with the AM9080, which was basically a reversed engineer clone of the Intel 8080. But in 1977, AMD entered a new phase, with Siemens, a German engineering company looking to enhance its technology expertise and enter the American market. Siemens purchased 20% of AMD stock and both companies established AMC, Advanced Microcomputers, located both in Silicon Valley and Germany. This allowed AMD to finally enter the microcomputing developing and manufacturing field based on AMD's second source Zilog Z8000 microprocessors. But only two years after, when both companies' visions for AMC diverged, AMD bought out Siemens' stake in the American division, closing advanced microcomputers in 1981, after switching focus to manufacturing second-source Intel microprocessors. Just one more time. It was only in 1996 that AMD released their first in-house processor, and it was the K5. The K was a reference to kryptonite, the only substance known to harm Superman, maybe implying that this processor line would be the only one harming their rival Intel. And the number 5 was a reference to the 5th x86 gen processors. This paved the road to the AMD processors we have nowadays, but what about the GPU department? Well, it was not until July 24 of 2006, with the AMD acquisition of the Canadian company ATI Technologies, that AMD actually had won. AMD paid $4.2 billion in cash and $1.2 billion in stock, for a total of $5.4 billion, 
this could very well lead AMD into a money shortage. And in October 2008, maybe due to that, AMD announced plans to stop producing the chips themselves, using Global Foundries, a multi-billion dollar joint venture with advanced technology investment company. Going fabulous and making that partnership gave AMD a very welcomed infusion of cash that allowed them to focus solely on chip design, which still stands today. As for branding, even though AMD bought ATI, their GPUs maintained the well-known ATI branding till August 2010, being then changed to the AMD brand name that we've known for years. And well, now that you know how it started, let's take a look at some of the AMD slash ATI achievements since 1984. October 15, 1984, industry's first single-chip burst error processor. The AM9580 delivered an integrated solution that helped advance smaller disk drive technologies and accelerate the growth of the emerging personal computer market. If you want to know, we also have the AM9080, which was basically a copy of Intel's 8080, created by reverse engineering, that cost 50 cents to make and were sold into the military market for $700. Quite the margin. <laughs> January 9, 1986, industry's first single-chip compression slash expansion processor. The AMD Lens AM7990 could expand and compress both text and image data simultaneously using three processing engines and two buzz architecture, an important step for the development of highly efficient office automation equipment. February 19, 1986, AMD introduces industry's first 1 million bit EEPROM. The AM27C1024 utilized AMD's unique CMOS process to create memories that could be erased by ultraviolet light and reprogrammed using a pulsed voltage. This allowed OEMs accelerate prototypes and customize products for different markets. July 1, 1987, industry's first graphics board compatible with every computer monitor, graphics interface and software on the market at that time. ATI's VIP VGA improved performance was a part of the ATI Wonder series and was the first card offering support for multiple graphics standards and monitors, all in a single card. The Wonder series added additional value to the inclusion of Buzz Mouse port, which normally required the installation of a dedicated Microsoft mouse adapter. Whew, rough times. November 1, 1995, industry's first 3D graphics chip. The ATI Max 64 GT, aka 3D Rage, was the first graphics adapter with a dedicated 3D processor, featuring the X5 support, 2MB SD RAM, 64-bit buzz, 60MHz core clock, 83 memory clock, and a 500 nanometers process node. And after 27 years, we're running 3000 MHz core clocks and 5 nanometers process nodes. March 27, 1996, AMD K5 first independently designed socket-compatible x86 microprocessor. It was the first x86 CPU to be independently designed by AMD. It was supposed to be released in 1995, but due to project delays it was only released in 1996. Its main contenders were the Intel Pentium CPUs and, interestingly enough, benchmarks can still be found online, where the K5 100MHz wins in some tests, of course, and the Pentium 100MHz wins in some others. April 2, 1997, AMD K6 helped dropping PC prices below $1,000. The AMD K6 was a CPU that you could use on motherboards designed for Intel Pentiums. Wait, Wait what? what? Yes, you heard it right. You could use an AMD CPU on an Intel motherboard. How crazy is that? Also, although the K6 naming suggests a strong connection to the K5, the design was actually completely different since it was based on the model NX686 created by NextGen that was bought by AMD. The success of the K-series helped paving the road to legendary CPUs such as the ones we're gonna talk about now. 
June 23, 1999, Athlon processor was the fastest x86 CPU available and utilized copper fabrication. As stated in a 1999 Tom's Hardware article, the AMD Athlon CPUs were finally stomping over the Intel Pentium 3 ones, and if you aren't old enough to remember those, they were pretty damn good CPUs. Unlike the Pentium 4 that were like little volcanoes, were still being more expensive and slower than the AMD counterparts, but well, like I said, the Pentium 3 CPUs were pretty good. And we had the Pentium 3 600 being 7-10% to slower than the Athlon 600 and AMD had also a 650MHz version that was even faster, leaving Intel in the dust in every single benchmark, even more in 3D Studio Max where the Athlon 600 was no less than 45.3% faster. Amazing. March 6, 2000, AMD released the first CPU to break 1 GHz barrier, 1 billion clock cycles per second. The CPU was called Athlon 1000 and was a single-core CPU based on the K75 core. AMD currently uses the Athlon branding for lower-end CPUs, but back in 2000, Athlon was the shit, spanking Intel's top-tier Pentium 3 CPUs in almost all benchmarks. AMD also released the Athlon 900 and 950, which were still competing very well with Intel CPUs, but the Athlon 1000 was definitely the start of the show. Although there were some aspects where Intel CPUs with lower frequencies would still dominate, like for example when playing memory intensive games like Unreal Tournament, where their full speed on dial to cache would make a big difference. April 22, 2003, the world's first x86 based 64 processor is released. The Athlon 64 is the third processor to bear the name Athlon and the immediate successor to the Athlon XP and the second processor after the Optron to implement the AMD 64 architecture, being the first 64-bit CPU on the consumer side. But what's the main difference in between 32 and 64 bits? Well, in its essence it means that the CPU can actually process 64 bits in parallel for a single element in a data format. For the average user, it means you stopped being limited to 3.2 GB of RAM, instead you can now use up to 17 billion GB of RAM, CPU sided of course, and that you can now have better multithreading abilities, which was very nice at the time. In terms of gaming performance, the Athlon 64 were just smashing the competition so hard that the fastest Pentium 4 by the time was just a bit over the lower end Athlons. Crazy, huh? And if we take in consideration that the AMD CPUs were less expensive in almost all countries, it made them a no-brainer for anyone looking for a new computer. August 21st, 2004. AMD released the first native x86 dual-core processor. And it was the first x86 dual-core processor because the first non-x86 dual-core was the Power 4, developed by IBM. It seems AMD was far ahead, but not really, as the Pentium D was released in the same month and was also dual core. Still, in most scenarios, the single core chips were still outperforming the dual core ones due to higher frequencies, and still, most applications only used one core, so the higher frequency chips were once again on top. And one of the reasons that made the Athlon series such a success was because Intel Pentium 4 and Pentium D CPUs were just bad in comparison, and it was only when Intel released the Core 2 series that the game changed. But that was only two years later. March 20, 2006, ATI introduced the first 1GB VRAM GPU. The ATI Fire GL7350 was the first workstation GPU to offer 1GB GDDR3 SD RAM aimed at professional users and having a little brother with only 512MB, the Fire GL7300. It was also a dual slot GPU, thing we didn't see much back then, and supported up to 3840 per 2400 which is above 4K resolution. It might not seem much, but for that time, it was like having 16K support. The GPU also featured DirectX 9.0C, a core clock of 600MHz and a memory clock of 650, this at only $1600. 
November 19, 2007, industry's first quad-core supporting scalable graphics. AMD Phenom quad-core processor platforms could deliver up to 2 teraflops of desktop processing power by harnessing 4 GPUs. Phenoms had a great naming scheme in my opinion, but the truth is that they were being outperformed by Intel's much faster and more efficient Core 2 Duo CPUs. And even the Phenom 2 CPUs were quite far from Intel Core 2 quads in terms of overall performance, but they were still performing quite well in some benchmarks and supported scalable graphics aka Crossfire, leading the CPUs to still sell considerably well. June 16, 2008 First GPU to break 1 teraflops barrier The AMD Firestream 9250 was the first GPU to break the 1000 gigaflops of FP32 performance. It was based on the RX 770 graphics processor, but with 625 MHz GPU clock and 993 MHz memory clock, featuring DirectX 10.1 support and 1 GB GDDR3. It wasn't a card for normal consumers, as it was a professional card, but it was definitely a nice mark in the history of GPUs. September 16, 2009 Industry's first sub-100 quad-core CPU for mainstream desktop platforms. The Athlon 2 series were based on the AMD K10 architecture, which was similar to Phenom 2 series. However, unlike the Phenoms, it did not contain any L3 cache. The main point of these CPUs was to be affordable and deliver decent performance, which they did, with single, dual, triple and quad-core variants in 2009 for the AM3 socket using 45 nanometers lithography and later with dual and quad-cores using 32 nanometers for the FM1 socket, which was the socket for the APU systems, but we're not gonna talk about that now but later instead. By the way, I bet you didn't know there were triple-core CPUs back then, huh? But it was not only the Athlons but also the Phenom CPUs that had triple-core variants as well. Pretty neat. January 4, 2011, world's first accelerated processing unit, APU. Fusion is what happens when AMD technology, our partnerships, and our customers' dreams collide. With its first name being AMD Fusion, while later being called APU, Accelerated Processing Unit, the APU combined the CPU and the GPU on a single die, offering a faster, smaller solution for integrated systems. Before the APUs, there were already iGPUs, of course, the only difference is that they were set in a different die from the GPU or the CPU, with the AMD APUs delivering those integrated graphics in the same die. The first CPUs rocked K10 CPU cores and HD 6000 series graphics, but their legacy isn't dead by any means and they actually became better with time. Nowadays we have APUs such as the Ryzen 5 5600G that can deliver a very good CPU experience, with the Vega cores also delivering what most people need for low-budget esports gaming, this while maintaining a really low power envelope. June 11th, 2013 Industry's first CPU to have a 5 GHz stock frequency In 2011 we had the AMD FX series, and although the series was one of AMD's biggest fails, it was also one of the longer lasting platforms they had. The FX series were amazing on paper with clustered multi-threading design instead of the traditional simultaneous multi-threading, but while clustered multi-threading was offering a way better performance in terms of multi-threading with its modules instead of full cores, the single core performance was quite low because the two cores inside the module were sharing the same LAU, arithmetic logic unit, and L2 cache, and with a low amount of software optimization for this design, things went terribly wrong. With the bad sales of the FX 4000, 6000 and 8000 series, AMD tried their luck with the AMD FX 9000 series, which were out of the box overclocked to 5 GHz, although these CPUs were still slower than Intel counterparts in anything that wasn't multi-threading, and were also quite expensive, even more since they needed a very good motherboard otherwise the VRMs would fry or throttle hard due to their massive power consumption.
Interestingly enough, with all these years of software development, the FX8000 series CPUs like the 8350, for example, are still viable for some things once tweaked, leading me to believe that the CMT design was maybe a bit ahead of its time. September 25, 2013, AMD introduces a new API. Mantle was a low overhead rendering API aimed at 3D video games, developed in cooperation with DICE starting in 2013 and designed as an alternative to DirectX and OpenGL. In 2015, Mantle's public development was suspended and in 2019 completely discontinued, but its source code was also used in both DirectX 12 and Vulkan APIs, as AMD made a deal with Microsoft and later donated the source code to Kronos. Since Mantle was a low overhead and closer to the metal API, it was way more efficient than the X11 on AMD GPUs, delivering way higher frame rates, even more on CPU-heavy scenarios. Mantle paved the way to the newer APIs to come and it was a very important step forward. June 16, 2015 First GPU to combine HBM and DICE stacking technology in a single package. The R9 Fury series came as something that would revolutionize the GPU industry due to the new form factor and new HBM memory, high bandwidth memory. Still, that wasn't the case. Although the card was basically on par with the 980 Ti, there were some reasons why it failed per se. One of the reasons was that the card was already so juiced up that the gains from overclocking were almost zero. While the overclocked 980 Ti was consuming less power than the stock Fury X, while most times being over 20% faster. Another reason was most likely the fact that he had only 4GB VRAM, while the contestant 980 Ti had 6GB. And yeah, the 4GB were HBM and in most titles it wouldn't make the difference due to the higher memory bandwidth, but in others, it would. HBM2 was later introduced in the Vega cards as well, but this time AMD didn't make the same mistake, now using 8GB. March 2, 2017, world's highest performing and lowest powered 8-core desktop processors. In 2017, the CPU market was boring, to say the least, with Intel delivering around 5% performance increase per generation, while also in some cases forcing the user to get a new motherboard which somehow made fanboys happy, but made sane people really mad. And when the new AMD CPUs came out, they were a fresh breeze to the general public. And although they were carrying a bit of skepticism due to the earlier FX fiasco, that same skepticism was blown away as soon as people tried the so long-awaited Intel competitors. AMD was looking for their place back in the CPU market, and although Ryzen CPUs weren't the best gaming performers due to lower IPC and frequencies, they hit hard, with more cores and more threads than the competition, leading to better multi-threading performance, lower TDP as well, and a cherry on the top of the cake, a 329 MSRP for the Ryzen 7 1700, which was $10 below the i7 7700K that had half the cores and threads, which made the Ryzen 7 1700 an easy pick for most people. AMD also promised several generation of Ryzen CPUs in the same socket, opposed to Intel that usually changed the socket every two CPU generations. And that was also one of the things that led Ryzen CPUs to the top. People that bought a motherboard in 2017 can still use their most recent CPUs released in 2022, like the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D, which added a massive value to the AM4 platform. April 11th, 2017, industry's highest performance 6-core processor. One month after the Ryzen 7 1700, AMD targeted another performance tier, this time with the Ryzen 5 1600 that was up to 69% faster in multi-threading than the i5 7600K that was its competitor at the time. 
this because although it was still slower in terms of single core performance and overall gaming, it had 6 cores and 12 threads as opposed to the stagnated i5 chip with only 4 cores and 4 threads. Which even at the time was quite laughable and with the good reviews on the Ryzen 7 1700, the Ryzen 5 1600 also sold very well. One of the reasons was its longevity due to the more cores and threads, in fact, if you compare both CPUs with recently released games, the i5-7600K will most likely perform worse than the Ryzen 5 1600, while it was performing better in 2017. Although this wasn't all fun and games and the AM4 platform was plagued with memory issues and instabilities in its release. The first Ryzen CPUs in their first iterations would struggle to achieve 3200 MHz RAM frequencies unless you had Samsung BDI kits. And since RAM prices were quite high at the time, some people just took a step back from the AMD platform. Gladly, in the first year the RAM compatibility improved massively and more and more RAM kits could reach 3200 MHz. And if you grab a 2017B350 motherboard nowadays and update its BIOS, you're most likely able to run 3400 MHz RAM on a Ryzen 7 1700 or a Ryzen 5 1600. That's how much the AM4 platform evolved. June 27, 2017 – World's Fastest Graphics Card for Machine Learning Development Although we recently hear a lot about NVIDIA in anything related to machine learning, in 2017 the AMD Radeon Vega Frontier Edition was actually the fastest card for machine learning development supporting up to 256TB of GPU memory. In terms of hardware, it was kind of an improved Vega 64 with 16GB HBM2. It brought a unique design in the colors blue and yellow to match the colors in the professional AMD drivers. Its water-cooled model though was yellow and blue, which was quite interesting to see. Not as good looking as the Fury X, for example, but interesting to see. In terms of benchmarks, it was usually in between the GTX 1080 and 1080 Ti, in some cases like Luxmark 3.1 being in front of those cards by a good margin, this while being priced at $999, which was way lower than the Quadro GPUs from Nvidia. In terms of gaming, this card was a failure because even with prices as low as $500 after the mining craze, the GTX 1080 was still performing way better and in some titles, even the GTX 1070 or a Crossfire RX 580 kit would outperform this card, while consuming less power. But well, for machine learning development, it was definitely worth it. August 10, 2017, industry's first 16-core AGDT processor. Six months after the first Ryzen CPU got released, AMD was looking to reach a wider range of users, so they picked the stronger point of the Zen architecture, the multi-threading, and released their first AGDT processor. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe AMD always had server solutions, but they never had an AGDT processor before. But now they did with the Ryzen Threadripper. The first Threadripper CPUs released were the 1920X with 12 cores and 24 threads and the 1950X with 16 cores and 32 threads being the first AGDT processor with that amount of cores. The 1950X was a direct competitor to the 10 cores 20 threads i9-7900X that was released one month before and was only $10 cheaper, although it featured 6 cores and 12 threads less than the 1950X. And even though the first generation of Threadripper CPUs didn't support AVX 512 instructions, they were already cannibalizing the Intel sales as they offered a higher number of cores at the same price. These CPUs paved the way to the HDT monsters like the Threadripper 3990X that have 64 cores and 128 threads. That same CPU offered performance compared and sometimes higher than the Intel Xeon 8280, costing over $10,000 at the time, while costing only $3,449. This shows us how much AMD evolved in terms of AGDT processors in a few years and how they led to lower prices in this same market. November 6, 2018 
world's first GPU to achieve 1 terabyte per second memory bandwidth. When everyone was waiting for a new GPU arc like RDNA and thought that the Vega arc was dead and ready to be buried, AMD announced the Radeon Instinct MI60, which used the Vega 20 graphics processor, which was GCN 5.1. This was not only the first GPU to achieve 1 terabyte per second of memory bandwidth, but also the first GPU to use a 7 nanometers process, although it was still using Vega, and that alone was a limiting factor due to how squeezed the architecture was already. Its competitor was the Quadro RTX 8000, and although it was built using TSMC's 12 nanometers process node, it still managed to outperform the MI60 in most scenarios. In terms of pricing, somehow I was unable to find anything about MI60's MSRP, but I do know that the MSRP of the RTX 8000 was around $10,000, and even looking at the last prices available in stores, we had the Instinct MI60 at around $2,500, while the RTX 8000 was still around $5,500, leading me to believe that maybe the Radeon Instinct MI60 was not a bad deal. January 9, 2019, Industry's first 7 nanometers gaming GPU. Well, Radeon 7 is a GPU that most don't even know or remember. Why? Well, because besides being the first gaming GPU to use TSMC's 7 nanometers process node, it didn't have anything to offer. It was released as the AMD's best gaming GPU 5 months after the RTX 2080 and at the same price this while being slower in anything gaming related and consuming more power. It was also pretty expensive to make due to being based on multi-chip module design with a 7 nanometers Vega GPU plus 4 stacks of HBM2 memory, leading AMD to cease its production only 5 months after its release, as it was already being cannibalized by their newer and much cheaper RDNA GPU, the RX 5700 XT. This was the last GPU that used Vega architecture being followed by the new RDNA and RDNA2 GPUs that were a massive upgrade featuring lower power draw and way better performance. August 7, 2019 World Record Breaking Data Center CPU Performance If you don't know what Epic CPUs are, well, like we have the Ryzen CPUs for mainstream and the Threadripper CPUs for AGDT, we also have the Epic CPUs for data centers and servers. The first AMD Epic processors were released in 2017 and disrupted Intel's absolute domination in the data center market, but it was only in 2019 with the AMD Epic 7002 series that AMD really turned the game in terms of performance and price performance, making cheaper and faster options, and that's the wet dream of every data center owner. These CPUs held such a high performance per dollar value that the Epic 7742 performed better than the Xeon Platinum 8280 while costing $3000 less and consuming less power, making it the way to go for data centers as the owners could save money in the buying process and over the years with electricity bills. A must indeed. November 7, 2019 industry's first and fastest 16-core mainstream desktop processor. After the release of the Ryzen CPUs in 2017, AMD managed to do major advances in several fronts, and one of those advances was the Ryzen 3000 series featuring the Zen 2 Arc, which brought way higher single-core performance and even better multi-threading ability. This while also being the first CPU series made on TSMC's 7 nanometers process node. This generation also brought the Ryzen 9 branding, something that we didn't have in the two previous generations, featuring the first and the fastest 16-core processor that you could use on your $100 motherboard. Just like that! When the first Ryzen CPUs launched, having a Threadripper with 16 cores and 32 threads was already an astonishing achievement, but having an even faster CPU with the same number of cores and threads on a consumer-grade motherboard was just out of this world. 
Also, the 3950X brought Zen 2 cores, meaning it was not only about multi-threading, but also the gaming performance. For a matter of perspective, the i9-10900K had been released almost 6 months later and it was still being pushed around by the 3950X, and even in terms of gaming, they were pretty much on par. This while the i9 was more expensive and consumed more power, making the 3950X an absolute bargain for users wanting heavy multi-threading with gaming in the mix. October 8, 2020 World's Fastest Gaming CPUs in 2020, Ryzen CPU's market share was getting bigger by the day due to the big success of the Ryzen 3000 series that although not being the fastest CPUs for gaming, were definitely the better ones in terms of price performance, at least in the higher tiers, since the i3 10100F and 11100F were still the kings in the lower tier markets. But AMD wanted to dominate, and for that they released the Ryzen 5000 series rocking the new Zen 3 architecture, featuring up to 19% IPC over the Zen 2 arc, while maintaining almost the same power draw. This was due to several improvements like the elimination of CCX core complexes, or the fact that each core could now access the full 32MB L3 cache instead of being limited to 16MB per CCD. This made AMD gain once again the performance crown that wasn't theirs for years and years, and brought back their branding to premium instead of being the budget option. Sadly, since Ryzen 5000 series were smashing Intel 10th generation counterparts across the board, AMD pushed a substantial price increase that didn't make people happy, mostly on the 5600X that got an MSRP of $300, which should be around the MSRP of the Ryzen 7 ones. Back in the day, the 5000 series also didn't have any CPU below the 5600X, which made things quite odd and allowed Intel to dominate even more on the sub $300 market, with the arrival of their 11th series mostly, the awesome i5-11400F and the i3-11100F processors. October 28, 2020 Fastest AMD Gaming Graphics Architecture ever. In the past few years, AMD GPUs were never a menace to the NVIDIA ones, as AMD architecture was inferior in terms of gaming performance, but things started to change when the new RDNA Arc got released, with the RX 5700 XT performing considerably better than the older generation Vega 64, while being cheaper and more power efficient. Although AMD didn't have anything to compete with Nvidia in the higher tiers, and if they did, well, they scrapped the idea to maybe, maybe save some money. And Lisa Su said herself that AMD wouldn't be competing in the enthusiast level in that generation, focusing mostly on the price performance ratio of the mid and lower tier cards. Gladly, the new RDNA GPUs, the RX 6000 series, were even better than anyone expected, featuring a whopping 25 times performance per watt increase, and this time with GPUs getting released across all performance tiers, from the smaller 6500 XT to the bigger RX 6900 XT, later receiving a 6950 XT revision. These new GPUs delivered an astonishing performance per watt value, being faster and more power efficient than most NVIDIA RTX 3000 cards, something that didn't happen for years and years. This was also due to the introduction of Infinity Cache that increased the, the cache values of the GPUs by a huge amount, and the crazy high frequencies that even the best NVIDIA GPUs couldn't touch leaving a huge mark for the RDNA 2 architecture as the first one in over a decade to beat NVIDIA GPUs in terms of performance per watt, and also the first one ever to have GPUs achieving 3 GHz on air, like the little 6500 XT. November 16, 2020 World's fastest HPC accelerator for scientific research, the MI100 as I told you before, the RDNA architecture was a major performance leap, and the same RDNA arc led to the creation of the CDNA arc, the professional side of RDNA. The MI60 presented in this video before was the first GPU to achieve 1 terabyte per second of memory bandwidth since it was using Vega arc with HBM2, but it wasn't the best available, 
but this time AMD focused on top performance with the CDNA Arc, being the AMD Instinct MI100, the world's fastest HPC accelerator for scientific research. Overall, a great fit for AMD in the HPC market. End of 2020 Smart Access Memory in the end of 2020, AMD was losing to Nvidia in terms of overall performance. Not by much, but still behind, even more in terms of ray tracing. So they took an existing technology called Resizable Bar and made their own implementation of it called Smart Access Memory. In conventional systems, processors can only access a fraction of the graphics memory, usually 256 megabytes, meaning that for a processor to call 1 gigabyte of VRAM, it would have to make 4 separate calls, while with smart access memory, the data channel gets expanded to harness the full GPU memory in a single call if needed, reducing unnecessary work and optimizing performance, in some cases by a huge amount. This wasn't something created by AMD and Nvidia released their own implementation of Resizable Bar shortly after, but it wasn't even close to AMD's implementation that brought astonishing performance gains in games like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Forza Horizon 5, Horizon Zero Dawn, in between many others. The technology was firstly announced as working solely with the Ryzen 5000 and RX 6000 series, but its support was later expanded to other Ryzen CPUs and even Intel ones, being also introduced for the Ryzen 5000 series in the Adrenaline 21.9.1 drivers. March 15, 2021 The world's highest performing server processor AMD had been in a pretty good position in the server market for the past few years in terms of price performance, having the previous Epic 7742 as the world's fastest data center processor, and in March 2021 the Epic 7763 took its place. Featuring the same 64 cores 128 threads but now using the much better Zen 3 architecture, leading to a way better multi-threading performance and turning this CPU into the world's fastest server processor. Intel wouldn't be quiet of course and they released a direct competitor at around the same $8000 MSRP, which was the Xeon Platinum 8380 featuring the new advancements from Ice Lake architecture. Still, it wasn't viable due to several reasons. Firstly, performance-wise it was slower due to having 40 cores and 80 threads as opposed to 64 cores and 128 threads in the Epic 7763, and one of the deal breakers was that they used the new 4189 socket, meaning that data centers wanting to upgrade from the Xeon 8368 to the 8380 would need to upgrade their motherboards as well. While with the Epic 7763, all they needed to do was to remove their older 7742 and put their new 7763, with no further costs associated. May 31, 2021 AMD 3D Chiplet Technology Chiplet Plus 3D Stacking if you don't know what chiplet design is, it is basically how Ryzen processors are made. Instead of having a single monolithic die as in older generations, AMD found out that chiplet design was the way to go for more performance and better efficiency, having several dies in the same chip connected using Infinity Fabric. And in 2021, AMD made a step forward by announcing the first 3D chiplet technology that combined AMD's innovative chiplet architecture with 3D stacking to provide over 200 times the interconnect density of 2D chiplets and more than 15 times the density compared to the existing 3D packaging solutions. In 2022, this technology gave birth to the first CPU in history using 3D stacked cache, that AMD called 3D V cache. The first CPU showed running this technology was the Ryzen 9 processor. Strangely, the CPU that got released was the well known Ryzen 7 5800X, that due to this technology was called Ryzen 7 5800X 3D. 
even with slightly lower frequencies going from 32 megabytes of L3 cache to 96 megabytes was a major uplift in terms of gaming performance, making the old 5800X from 2020 outperform the newer Intel CPUs like the 12900KS, both running at stock, while consuming less power and being almost half the price. Obviously, the AMD CPU would not outperform the competition in all titles, like CSGO, but it was indeed outperforming the competition in titles where cache was properly used, like Far Cry 6, GTA 5 and even Total War games, making it one of the best gaming CPUs in the world and definitely the best when it came to price performance, even more since you could use it in an older and cheaper motherboard. And so guys, we've reached the end of our little documentary, of our mini documentary. And I have to tell you that with the time that I spent making this video, I could have easily, and I repeat, easily done six or seven videos of the, of the ones that I usually do, GPU comparisons and so on. This video took lots and lots of hours. So all I really ask you is to share. If you really enjoy the video, just share it. Share it with your friends. Share it on social media like um, Facebook, like Twitter, even on Reddit if you can share it on AMD's Reddit because it w I would feel really really bad if, uh, if after all these dozens of hours uh, the video just had a few views, I just wanted, I really wanted to... Um, to at least have like, I don't I don't know, like 20,000, 30,000 views at least. I drank so much coffee that I believe that at a time, uh, instead of having caffeine in the blood, I actually had blood in the caffeine because, <laughs> you know, it was that bad. But anyway, really hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, once again, share it if you can to help the channel, to help me and to help my work. Um, and in 2022, we, we will actually have some more very interesting things from the AMD part. We'll have the Zen 4 CPUs, the Ryzen 7000 series. We will also have, for example, the, um, the RDNA 3 GPUs, which I'm very excited to test. Um, and on the Intel side, we will also have the Intel 13th generation. And we'll have also the RTX 4000 series from NVIDIA. Things are looking pretty great and I'm eager to test all, all these, uh, these hardware parts. I even wanted to test the Intel Arc GPUs, but they are nowhere to be found in Europe and I believe it's the same for America, so yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot for watching, I'm Fabio Pisco from Ancient Gameplays and see you in the next one.